You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. More and more, we are dependent on data. Right? More and more, our world is intermediated by technology. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hi, Dave. On this week's show, I've got the story of a facial recognition research project that claims to be able to predict criminality. Ben takes a look at privacy in the face of contact tracing apps and the coronavirus. And later in the show, my conversation with Jules Polonetsky. He's the CEO of the Future of Privacy Forum. And we're going to be talking about how privacy is better understood as a human right. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. And we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCorps Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. And we are back. Ben, before we get into this week's stories, we've got some follow-up from a listener. Uh, This person writes in and they say, uh, this is about the caveat episode, you don't own your photos. Thanks for another great episode. Well, thank you. Uh, The question I have is, (laughs) what if the photographer posted only a low-res copy to Instagram and made high-res copies available for a price? Now, let me back up here. The story we were talking about was about how uh, Instagram's EULA basically states that they have rights to your photos. So if someone then uses Instagram's capabilities to embed your photo in another website, as the photographer, you don't have any control over that. You don't have any rights over that. So I'll continue with this uh, listener's letter here. They, they continue. Would the first person she licensed a high-res copy to be able to distribute that willy-nilly because she had posted a low-res copy on Instagram? In other words, does the Instagram EULA say, I give you this copy of the photo or I give any form of this photo? Ben, what do you think? So first of all, it's a, it's a great question. My read of it is, according to the EULA, Instagram only retains those intellectual property rights in the photo that you post on Instagram. So any other site can embed it without you, the user, retaining those intellectual property rights. Mm-hmm. So to answer the question, I think if you posted the inferior low resolution photo on Instagram, then Instagram would have the right to have that embedded on other sites. They would have no intellectual property rights in the higher resolution photo that you did not post on their platform. So Hmm. this might actually be useful for people who are doing professional photography. You know, it's sort of the equivalent to giving a sample at a store, which is a very pre-COVID phenomenon (laughs) uh, versus giving somebody, you know, the whole birthday cake. You can hmm. post a far inferior, low resolution version of the photo. Maybe has a big watermark on it. Exactly. The 200 by 400 version and be like, look, if you actually want my best version of my own photography, you know, please give me your PayPal information. Interesting. So that would be, that would be my interpretation of it. It's just about Instagram only has rights to what you post on their site, not any other version of that photo. It's not the essence of the photo. It is the physical uh, arrangement of those particular bits that you have sent to Instagram itself. 
Exactly, because you could see, you know, why there might be a slippery slope there. If, you know, there was this distinction in any version of a photo, what if you had took successive photos of the same thing um, and you posted one of them on Instagram? Would Instagram retain rights in the rest of those photographs? If you went to a beautiful location in the Grand Canyon and took 20 pictures and posted one of them uh, on Instagram, does Instagram retain the right to the other 19? I think almost certainly they do not. Hmm. Okay. All right. Interesting. Well, uh, thanks to our listener for sending that in. Good follow-up question. Let's get to our stories. Ben, why don't you kick things off for us this week? Sure. So we are, of course, still in the midst of a global pandemic, and it's kind of worth stepping back once in a while to examine the privacy implications of potential solutions to get us out of this pandemic. And that largely relates to applications that do contact tracing. So my article this week comes from the Washington Post. It says, U.S. gears up for privacy debate as coronavirus phone monitoring expands globally. The beginning of the article is an anecdote from a left-leaning individual from Israel who's been a long opponent of pervasive government surveillance. And they asked her about an application in Israel that does contact tracing by sending somebody a notification if they come into contact with someone who's tested positive for the coronavirus. And that's Mm -hmm. done through Bluetooth. And this Mm -hmm. person's reaction was, you know what? I'm fine with that. I'm usually very wary of pervasive electronic surveillance, but desperate times call for desperate measures. And that sort Mm -hmm. of sets the scene about where we are in the United States. Obviously, the situation has has gotten rather grim. We have a lot of cases. We have a lot of fatalities. Apple and Google have developed an application. We talked about that on a previous version of our podcast that mm-hmm. potentially would allow for this type of contact tracing. It would be voluntary, but you know, it's something that potentially could help us get out of this problem. But there are a couple of limiting factors here. According to some polling, a number below 100% of polled individuals in the United States would download that voluntary app. And mm-hmm. if that number is below 60%, then experts estimate that that application would not be effective because it just would not be capturing enough cases. Hmm. Not to mention, there are a lot of people who still do not own smartphones in this country. And many of those people are the type of people who are particularly vulnerable to this virus. So older individuals, people with pre-existing conditions. So those are a couple of potential pitfalls of this program. And then there are, of course, privacy concerns. There have been some lawmakers on the Republican side in the United States Senate that are introducing privacy legislation related to these potential applications. Hmm. It would draw limits around personal health, geolocation, proximity data, protecting that information for the users. Democrats and also some privacy groups have expressed some opposition to this legislation for a couple of reasons. One, it doesn't have any sort of enforcement about people falsely posting that they're COVID positive, even if they have not actually received a test. That could lead to a lot of different false reports. And then very importantly, it would preempt all state privacy laws, which is particularly dangerous because as we know, and as we've talked about, some states have digital privacy laws that are much stronger than uh, what the federal government has right now. So that's sort of the lay of the land. Uh, The polling data they referenced is from a poll that was taken very recently, and it said that nearly three in five Americans are unwilling or unable to use a potential contact tracing application. And so we're right at that threshold where it it probably would not be effective in the first place. So to answer the article's question, you know, for a number of reasons, I'm not sure we're ready to dive in and have this phone monitoring work in our country as it's worked in uh, other countries across the, the globe. Yeah, and that's that's really a fascinating part of this, isn't it? That you have other nations who are able to say to their citizens, you will do this and <laughs> you, know, you you will install this app on your phone or you will allow us to to trace you this way. And from a public health point of view, you can imagine how that could help them get on top of this thing in a better way way than countries like ours where because of our values, we say these things have to be opt in. Yeah. So, you know, there are a couple of ways of looking at this. There's the China approach. And we've talked about this also. China is not exactly an example of a shining example of, of respecting civil liberties and privacy. The government assigns citizens a smartphone code based on their likeliness of exposure. And that dictates their ability to move about the country. At least that's how it worked during the months long Wuhan uh, lockdown. That's just not going to happen in this country. Uh, it's against our political culture. But then there are other countries 
uh, small d democratic countries where you are seeing the introduction of this technology. We've seen it in various European countries. This article talks about Israel. It is happening all over the world. And whether it's because their political culture is different, you know, we are also a more diverse country. We're not as homogenous as, say, some of the northern European social uh, democracies there. Right. Um, so we might be more prone to this type of skepticism and, and political conflict. But for whatever reason, you know, we're facing our own obstacles on this, even though other countries have been able to to work something out and they've done so effectively. The countries that have introduced any type of contact tracing, but specifically using applications, have done a better job than we have at, at suppressing the virus. So, you know, I think in an ideal world, we would use every tool at our disposal. And luckily, you know, two of our biggest technology companies have, have given us a potential tool. But, you know, it's important for us to step back and be like, is this really going to work in our country and why not? And I think what this article is getting at is there are a bunch of reasons. People's distrust of the government collecting data, the small percentage of people who don't own smart devices that would really be limiting factors in this eradicating the epidemic. Yeah, it's it's really uh, fascinating to think about. I can't help wondering if this is a, a situation where if you had a, a message coming down from the top, you know, a leadership type of thing of saying, hey, everyone, you know, this is got, you know, looking back to, uh, you know, buy bonds, right? Yep. You know, but, buy your war uh, bonds, support our, right. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, install the contact tracing app. It's it's uh, you know, take one for the team for your nation. We need you to to beat this pandemic. We all need to work together and uh, you know maybe uh, stretch our comfort zone here. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like there's a a place for that where that's going to come from, given the current situation and the the type of leadership we're seeing at the federal level. Yeah, I mean that's just not happening. Now the CDC put out a document that outlines criteria for these digital contact tracing tools. And that's guidance to public health departments, other local entities to determine which of these applications are safe to use that will protect user privacy. So that is coming from the federal government. But you're mm. right that there's no real leadership coming from the top persuading Americans that it is in our best interest uh, for this limited amount of time to do contact tracing. And mm -hmm. I don't see it happening. I mean, you look at something like something as simple as wearing masks. Masks. It is not a panacea. It's not going to solve this epidemic. But there is evidence that if everybody wore a mask, we could significantly lower the transmission of the virus. And certain states like ours in Maryland have actually mandated that people wear masks at grocery stores, masks or face coverings, uh, that is, at grocery stores or public transportation. You know, the message from the federal government has been very mixed on that question, that seemingly obvious question. At first, they told mm -hmm. us we didn't need face coverings. We should leave them for medical professionals. Right. And that was revised. And at the beginning of April, they told us you should wear them if you can't practice social distancing. But then, you know, we've seen some of our leaders at the federal level sort of explicitly or implicitly implicitly downplay the importance of wearing masks. For, so, for example, the president at an event yesterday in Arizona went to a mask-making factory but was not wearing a mask himself um, and, mm -hmm. and has not really spoken about, you know, compellingly about, you know, the need for all of us to make that small sacrifice. And that's, right. a, that's a much lower ask, in my opinion, than telling everybody to download an application that the government is going to use to help track the spread of a virus. Hmm. So I don't yeah. know if, you know, that type of federal leadership would actually work. You know, as I said, we are distrustful of what our government tells us. And maybe some of that distrust is necessary. But, you know, I'd certainly be interested in seeing them try. And we're just not seeing that uh, at the state level either. So it's not just the federal government that isn't really giving us direction. It's state and localities as well. All right. Well, it's an interesting article and it's certainly something uh, worth pondering. We'll have a link in the show notes, of course. Moving on to my story this week. Ben, every now and then we get one that is a real head scratcher. And this, I would say, is one of those. Fits the bell. Uh, yep. It does. It takes the form of a press release from the Harrisburg University of Science and Technology, which is a real institution of higher learning. We both Googled it just to make sure. <laughs> and when and when I when I describe what's going on here, uh, dear listener, you will understand why. The title of their press release is Facial Recognition Software Predicts 
criminality. So that is the actual full headline. That's not us, uh, you know, shortening the headline to to narrow it down to its essence. That's literally what the headline says, which was sort of hard for either of us to believe when we saw it. I checked this to make sure that it hadn't been released on April 1st. I checked to make sure that Harrisburg University wasn't some sort of parody site. I've looked up the names of the professors and, and the, the researchers listed in here. They are, they are real people. They have real resumes. They've done real work. Let me read on some of the things that this press release claims. Uh, it says, a group of Harrisburg University professors and a PhD student have developed automated computer facial recognition software capable of predicting whether someone is likely to be a criminal. With 80% accuracy and with no racial bias, the software can predict if someone is a criminal based solely on a picture of their face. The software is intended to help law enforcement prevent crime. Ben, before I go on. <laughs> yeah, I'm just sort of, it's all, it's all kind of sinking in for me. I'm, just, I'm trying to process this. One of the researchers is quoted as saying, we already know machine learning techniques can outperform humans on a variety of tasks related to facial recognition and emotion detection. This research indicates just how powerful these tools are by showing they can extract minute features in an image that are highly predictive of criminality. By automating the identification of potential threats without bias, our aim is to produce tools for crime prevention, law enforcement, and military applications that are less impacted by implicit biases and emotional responses. Our next step is finding strategic partners to advance this mission. To which I uh, submit good luck with that. (laughs) Yes. Uh, (laughs) Okay, so let's just start at some high-level things here. The ability to determine whether or not someone is a criminal by the look of them. Ben? (laughs) I have never seen any research indicating a correlation between certain facial features and somebody's proclivity for criminality. Even if there were a correlation, I mean, bringing that to law enforcement would be highly problematic because you would, you know, get information on a person not based on their past actions, based on their actual criminality, but you would perhaps put a watchful eye on them because of a facial feature. That seems to me to be almost the definition of bias. And then they assert that they can do this with an 80% level of confidence. I know 80% sounds you know, high in the grand scheme of things. To secure a conviction in a criminal court, you have to be far greater than 80% sure that a person has actually committed the crime. That's Hmm. the nature of the beyond a reasonable doubt test. 80% Hmm. really does not seem like that high of a threshold to me. I would be more impressed if they said something like 99%. And then they said that that this is not subject to racial bias, which, you know, they don't really offer any evidence for that claim. The first thing I saw when I saw the headline to this was this is an absolute nightmare in terms of introducing racial biases. We already know that just like humans, artificial intelligence systems uh, are racially biased. And I have no reason to believe that this technology, which is identifying particular facial features would make, you know, implicit assumptions based on the person's race. So, yeah, to say the least, it's it's highly problematic. And their justification is, well, you know, crime is a problem. So any tool that we can use to help address that problem, we're willing to make available to our strategic partners in law hmm. enforcement. Yes, crime is a problem, but just like all problems, there are some solutions that almost supersede the scope of the problem, and that's kind of my interpretation here. Let me try to play devil's advocate here, and and let's walk through a possible analogy. So let's imagine a security person at a department store whose job it is to sit behind the wall of monitors that are monitoring all of the cameras at that department store. And this person is a a grizzled old veteran who's been sitting there for years and years and years. And I would bet that if you asked that person, this person would be able to say that they could tell if they had a problem individual in their store by the look of them by the way they carried themselves, by the way they were moving around the store, by, in other words, they would be naturally doing some sort of filtering process for who they should watch and who they should not. 
And I don't know what we think about that <laughs> as to whether or not that's a, that's no, I'm a, not sure I like but, but that, I think it's frankly. a reality, right? Yeah. I, I think it's a reality. It is. Right. Yeah. I think it's a natural thing for someone to do. Isn't this uh, an automated version of that? I would say it's not because in that case, you'd be monitoring for certain behavioral tics. You know, if somebody looked nervous, if their hands were clammy, if they were looking around, if they were scoping out security cameras, that could indicate a reasonable level of suspicion that that person would be creating a crime. Hmm. So it depends on what you mean. You know, if that security guard was saying by the look of the person, my guess is they'd probably be talking more about that person's behavior, not – the look on, you know, what their what the shape of their face looks like. I mean, right. I think we'd all laugh at a human being who told us, I can tell, you know, that that person is a criminal because of where the wrinkles are located on their face. Mm-hmm. Um, and if a person, the shape of their skull. Exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, so if a person told me, you know, I'm a security guard at a mall and I can tell just by looking at a person whether they're going to be a criminal. The first thing that would come to my head is, wow, that person might have some racial biases. Right. Uh, And, you know, that's that would just be my natural reaction because we are literally judging people by their appearance. That seems to be at a very base level of, you know, the impetus behind racial bias. So I would be very skeptical of a department store security guard who did that to the same extent that I'd be skeptical of any artificial system um, that could do that. Also, can we touch on this this notion of predicting crime, of, of interfering with folks before they commit crimes? I mean, there's well, there's a fundamental problem with that in our system, right? I mean, we don't – that's not how we do things. It is not how we do things. So then, you know, the next step is let's say they were able to find some strategic partners who were interested in this, this technology. How would those partners use this? Would it be for predictive policing where they would, you know, put more cops in certain neighborhoods? We do have predictive policing technology. Generally, it's based on data. You know, sometimes the input of that data could be questionable and it can itself be reflective of biases, but at least it is data. It's not the contours of somebody's face. What about sex offenders where someone has to register? Uh, neighbors can be alerted if there's a sex offender in their in their neighborhood. And to me, I mean, that's a case where someone may have committed a crime. They may have paid their debt to society by either spending time in jail or paying a fine or doing whatever uh, work the, the judge has said that they need to do, but yet they will still have this mark on them because uh, my understanding is that's an area where um, there's a lot of repeated crimes over the period of someone's life. There's a high likelihood of that. Yeah, and as you say, that's what the data reflects. The data reflects that people who commit those types of sex crimes are likely to commit them again. I've seen plenty of episodes of Law and Order Special Victims Unit to be well aware of, of that statistic. Um, <laughs> so at least that's based on somebody's past behavior. Yes, they've paid their right. debt to society, but we have statistical evidence that people who have been convicted of sex crimes are more likely to, to convict them in the future. There's some proven link there. If there is a proven link here between an inert quality of an individual, which is the contours of their face, and that person's proclivity to commit crimes, I would need to, I mean, I think all of us would need to sort of look under the hood. How do they compile that data? Because if it's garbage in, in terms of the data that's being inputted, it's going to be garbage out. And if there's a false correlation, uh, you're going to get a lot of false positives. And no matter how a law enforcement agency uses this information, that could potentially lead to false arrests uh, and false accusations. So it's just mm-hmm. it's very disturbing to me. I had sort of the same reaction you did when I when I came across this is, come on, like, is this real? Could this possibly be real? What if it is? What if it turns out that these folks have come up with something new and they are able to predict with 80 percent accuracy whether or not someone's likely to commit a crime? What then? I mean, that's that's a great question. I still think the technology would not be worth using because it would put a watchful eye on individuals who have done absolutely nothing wrong. There's no suspicion that they have committed a crime. There's no suspicion that they would commit a crime. Uh, it's simply 
putting a mark of suspicion on somebody based on an innate quality for which they do not have control. And I think mm-hmm. from a moral perspective, that's that's wrong. I hesitate to use this example, and it's going to sound rather crass, but if you had statistics saying a certain racial group or a certain subgroup demographic group is more likely to commit crimes. And, you know, so the cop on the street will say, well, if there's a such and such person in this neighborhood, it's more likely than than not that they're a criminal. Um, right. I think we'd all have moral problems with that. So to me, this sort of presents the same types of issues. Hmm. Even if it were a successful predictive tool, I would have an enormous difficulty, both ethically and from a practical sense, having law enforcement use this technology. And I'm, I'm pretty sure most people would feel the same way. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It'll be uh, one we uh, will certainly have to keep an eye on to see how they progress here, see if they uh, release more information uh, as they publish uh, and uh, go through peer review, see what happens. Yeah, apparently there's going to be a future book series, Springer Nature Research Book Series, Transactions on Computational Science and Computational Intelligence. I certainly like to read that to look under the hood, um, and I just hope the contours of our face Uh, Our faces, Dave, do not indicate that we uh, have a proclivity to commit crimes. I'm hopeful. (laughs) No, you, you, I know we both have that look about us. We sure do. (laughs) We sure do. Hey, everybody, it's Dave here uh, with a quick interruption and update. Uh, Since we recorded this episode, the folks at Harrisburg University have taken down the tweet and the announcement about this program. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. Normally we have links to the project, and at the moment they do not exist. So this is a developing story, and of course we will follow up as things develop. Back to the show. Uh, It's time to move on to our listener on the line. Our listener on the line this week, uh, his name is Paul, and uh, he writes in. He says, I'm a security operations manager in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, have you discussed the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986? In short, law enforcement can ask for any stored information, including emails that reside on a remote server, think cloud or Gmail, that is over 180 days old by sending a request. No warrant needed. The data is considered abandoned under the law and treated like trash left on the side of the road to be picked up by the waste disposal company. Ben, what's your take here? It's uh, This is one I, I think probably isn't on most people's radar. Yeah, so it's an excellent question. Uh, this relates to the 1986 law he references, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. One of the elements of that law is something called the Stored Communications Act. Now, 1986, which, um, not to age myself, that happens to be the, the year I was born, uh, is <laughs> a rather long time ago at this point. It's been 34 years. And the law has really not been updated since then. And hmm. the person who wrote in this question is correct, that the letter of the law says that any stored communication over 180 days old, law enforcement does not need to obtain a traditional warrant to gain access to that information. That obviously seems very outdated in an age of cloud computing, where most of us retain all of our emails. Google servers are large. Those of us who right. use Gmail, uh, you know, we're probably talking about millions of emails dating back, you know, ten or more years. So that standard seems greatly outdated. And a prominent court, the Sixth District Court of Appeals, a federal court, has agreed with us and said that that standard is outdated. The case was Uh. Warshock v. uh, the United States, and it was decided actually around the time that this person posted a a news article about this in their question. And it's around the time that news article came out. So it was late 2010. That case held that a person does have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the content of one's stored communications, of one's emails. That means, according to that case, no matter how long that communication has been stored, the government needs a warrant, a traditional warrant based on probable cause, to extract that email from the service provider. Hmm. Now, technically, that case only has applicability in the Sixth Circuit. I will note that most other courts across the country have extended the reasoning of that Warshock case. What Congress has tried to do numerous times is enact something called the Email Privacy Act. That law would take the Warshock case and make it the law of the land. So Hmm. in every judicial circuit in the country, the government would need to obtain a warrant to obtain somebody's 
stored communications. The most recent version of this bill actually has passed the House of Representatives uh, in the current session of Congress. It was passed as part of a larger intelligence policy bill. It has not passed the Senate. Um, And this Hmm. bill has been introduced a number of times. It has pretty broad uh, bipartisan support. Uh, I think hopefully for a lot of us, it's just a matter of time before that Warshock standard is applied nationwide. And I think, you know, the best way to look at it is the government does not need a warrant to obtain routing information. So the metadata, you know, when that email was sent, to which address it was sent to. And that's the way it's always been with traditional mail. Um, You don't Mm -hmm. need a warrant to obtain the addressing or routing information on the outside of an envelope, but the government has always needed a warrant to obtain the information inside of that envelope, the private message that I'm sending you. And so I think that's sort of the the rationale of the Warshot case and certainly uh, the rationale that that Congress pretty clearly believes in if, you know, this bipartisan support of the Email Privacy Act is any indication. All right. Interesting stuff. Did you have to look that up or did you have that off the top of your head? I looked some of it up. (laughs) I was not sure whether the Email Privacy Act had actually passed. I like I obviously okay. know about the Warshot case. I did, right, I, had, right. I did not know until today that it had actually passed the House this session. I see. All right, Professor. <laughs> well, thanks to our listener uh, Paul for sending that in. Uh, great question and uh, really nice uh, to be able to provide some clarity on that. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul. Of course, we would love to hear from you. Our caveat call-in number is four one zero six one eight three seven two zero. You can leave a message there and we will answer it on the air. You can also send us an email. It's caveat at the cyberwire.com. Coming up next, my conversation with Jules Polonetsky. He is the CEO of the Future of Privacy Forum. We're going to be talking about how privacy could be better understood as a human right and some of the privacy risks that he thinks are going to be growing in prominence in the days ahead. Uh, But first, a word from our sponsors. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. And we are back. Uh, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Jules Polonetsky, uh, CEO of the Future of Privacy Forum. We covered a lot of different topics uh, about privacy, some of the things that are on his radar in the days ahead. Uh, here's my conversation with Jules Polonetsky. I started uh, the Future of Privacy Forum uh, about 11 years ago after serving as the chief privacy officer at uh, AOL, at uh, DoubleClick now part of Google, as a um, congressional staffer, a state legislator, the uh, Consumer Affairs Commissioner for New York City. During all those roles, I thought there was a gap in the privacy debate. There were trade groups who supported their industry's interest. That's their mission. Often had to have you know, a lot of consensus before moving forward. And there were civil society and advocacy groups who advocated and litigated and criticized because, well, that was their mission. There weren't as many people in the middle who were, I'd say, optimistic about tech and data, really believing that we're getting new services, we're advancing research that can be helpful. But indeed, you will do bad things and you will create a scary Orwellian society or discriminate or expose if you don't actually really work hard to figure out what are the safeguards, what are the rules. So our goal when I started the organization was to create a place that 
focused on what's coming next. What are the new technologies where we don't have the rules yet? Maybe we don't have a law and it's not clear what's good practice. Maybe we have a law or need a law, but how do you actually do it in a way that is effective, that lets you support the socially beneficial things and deter the negative things? And I didn't think that there was enough activity across sectors because nobody has the full truth there. Advocates are smart. They're they're worried. They're concerned. They may not know the full picture. Industry knows what it knows, very often sits in its place and can miss important issues that other stakeholders have. Government does its best, but government works in a certain pace and can have its challenges. Academics work in a different way and live in their particular disciplines. There wasn't, I thought, enough activity that brought all of those players together to argue it out, to learn from each other, to debate, to disagree. So here we are 11 years later, we've got about 200 or so companies involved typically the chief privacy officer of the world, the senior people. And when I say companies, I certainly mean, you know, the big platforms, I mean, startups, I mean, retail, I mean, banking, but I also mean the leaders at cities who are trying to advance smart city projects, do better at delivering services to communities. I'm thinking of ed tech companies providing services to schools, but also school districts and state boards of education. Pretty much anybody who is interested in how we use data and what are the social, ethical, legal policy implications? How do I follow the laws? What should the laws be? How do I make sure I'm not being creepy? How do I set norms? How do I work with the different stakeholders? So as you can imagine, we're in the midst now of the, I hope, the beginning of the end of the COVID crisis. Maybe we're still at the beginning. And the questions we're struggling with now uh, are the questions that privacy commissioners and companies and everybody is struggling with. How how can I help? How can I use the data I have, location data, browsing data, ISP data? What can I do to help without making the problem worse by exposing privacy, by violating rules? So that's who we are. It strikes me that um, certainly in the time that you've been at this, so over the last 11 years, the status of privacy has really been elevated in the conversation. It, it's it's really come to the fore. One thing I would love to say is that it's never really been about privacy. Hmm. Well, let me qualify that. A little bit of it is about privacy, right? I mean, we don't want to get emails we don't want. Um, we don't want to post a picture and then find that the wrong person saw it or that it got shared It certainly is to some degree about exposing our information. Do we want others to see it? Do we want companies to have it? But that's a very small picture. The bigger picture, and the Europeans are are perhaps more effective in talking about this, you know, this is data protection, which is intended to support a wide range of rights and freedoms, speech, freedom of association, equity, discrimination, bias, power, right? Right somebody has data, they've got a lot of power. Now, do I trust them to have that power? Maybe I do, right? In a time of crisis, I might want the government to know who's infected and they should be telling me where I should go or not go. I may want them to know where the disease is spreading. And so things that I might otherwise want held very close, I actually may now say, well, wait a second, this impacts, you know, these challenges so I want the data to go, but, but whoa, I don't want it to go everywhere. I don't want it to be used mm. against me. I, I don't want to be locked up. I want to know that I'm being helped or that society is, is being helped. So it's true that more and more we are dependent on data, right? More and more our world is intermediated by technology. And so it shouldn't be surprised that the, you know, the issues that have always been issues in the world, the power of government, the power of big companies, how we make decisions about each other, and then lots of new decisions, right? Self-driving cars and and filter bubbles about the content we see. So there's certainly a whole host of new ways, but it's it's an old story, right? It's Hmm. who's in power? Do I trust them? How do I interact with other people in my community, in my village, in my city? It's more dependent on data before, but it's the same debates and the same questions. What's happened is that I think what were esoteric questions about cookies and tracking are now like who's actually in charge of our democracy? Are the Russians, you know, uh, fooling us with their ads? Are the platforms shaping what we see and believe? Um, So the 
and we're never going to solve those things, right? I mean, we, we've been battling those questions for, for generations. These are things hmm. that like the constitution determines. And suddenly the way a particular technology company structures itself is wired right into that exact question. Over the course of time, over the course of history, do these things swing back and forth like like a pendulum, the, the balance between individuals' protections and, and how they view privacy and, and so forth? Are, are there cycles to these things? Yes and no. So obviously, let's just take a look at the, the swing, even just during my career. When I started mm-hmm. out, I was at DoubleClick, and the big concern was cookies and ad banners and ad personalization. And that was new and it was concerning. Who would know what what sites you went to? And was it too creepy that ads were tracking you? What should the rules be? And then uh, the ad market crashed and all the things that these companies wanted to do wasn't going to happen or not so quickly. It's all happening today. And then 9-11 came and debating cookies seemed really trivial because now we were debating, why didn't the government know enough to put these pieces together. Like there was information about people, you know, right, learning to fly planes. There was information about people's backgrounds and, and people coming mm-hmm. into the country. How stupid is the bureaucracy that these things all exist, but they somehow were not connected. And so we spent a lot of time working through the technical ability to scoop all that up and put authorities in place that would allow that. And then we spent the next number of years reacting to, wait, did they say go too far? Or did they even go further than we thought? Did they interpret their authorities in a way that lets them bulk collect all the information? And then the Snowden revelations, you know, surprised many people with the extent of the way the NSA had interpreted some of these authorities. And was it an intrusion? And then 9-11, although it's certainly always going to be in the memory of many of us who, you know, saw the towers fall and the like, but it's a few years in history and and it's receded from the day-to-day debate. And guess what? The companies are back. And now they're even more essential to our lives. It's not just about ad banners, right? It's about Mm. social media, which wasn't as big a factor back then. It's about smart speakers in my home. And so all of a sudden, it's about self-driving cars. All of a sudden, biometrics, DNA is being analyzed. And, you know, small commercial companies have detailed insight into my DNA. So all of a sudden, it's back. And it's actually happening. And it's trivial to think of how Double Cook had cookies. Well, now everybody knows everything about you the minute you're online and is auctioning and competing to bid for your data to try to personalize an ad and, and get your attention. And so that definitely is a cycle and a swing, I think, back and forth. But mm. I think the issues and the structure, you know, the reason I've been able to do this for, for 20 years is it's the same set of questions over and over and over again, Right. What's being collected? Do people understand? Is it a surprise? Is someone going beyond what is the norm? Is the norm in the industry (laughs) out of sync with what actual people understand? And then are we all shocked when we learn the extent of location tracking? Are there safeguards? Are there limits? Are there restrictions? Is the data deleted? Does it go to the government? Does it go to everybody where I don't have any control of it? Can I do something about it? What actually is being harmed? Do I only care about whether I have financial harm, identity theft, someone's being hurt, someone's being stalked? Do I care about more ephemeral or or more esoteric harms, right? Uh, That I'm in a filter bubble and someone's deciding all the information I see. Do I care that I have some sense that I'm being watched and maybe I don't search for things that I'm interested in? So when I say, you know, ephemeral, esoteric, I just mean maybe not immediate physical or financial harm. Are there emotional or intellectual or societal you know, impacts. Same set of questions. The attention swings for sure. Look, we're debating now the access by government or uh, others to location data to be able to trace quarantine and to understand the, the movement of the um, the spread of the pandemic. And I've answered question after question from media and others. Are we risking weakening our privacy standards because of this? And my answer is, it's not a weakening of any privacy standard. Privacy or data protection always recognizes that there are moral and ethical ways data can and should go, and there have to be safeguards to make sure that that goes as intended. And so there is a new context now. There is an emergency. I'm not losing privacy when I'm at my doctor and I like take off my shirt 
but in the middle of the street, I would. When mm. I take that same garment off with my loved one, there's no privacy issue there, right? I want to be naked. Right, um, right. But, but each of them can even mess that context up, right? If I'm at a nude beach, well, that's not really a privacy problem, right? If mm. my doctor has the door open and someone peeks in or, or, you know, something inappropriate happens, well, even there, that's messed up. And even my loved one, if they take a picture of me and, you know, share it, uh, you know, uh, inappropriately. Uh, so so context matters. Professor Helen Nissenbaum, probably the leading philosopher of privacy today in academic, wrote a fabulous book years ago that's become a, a real standard called Privacy in Context. And she helps define how what we consider, quote unquote, private is always defined by the individual expectation I have. I gave you the note. I didn't expect you to do anything else with it. You published it. You handed it on. You violated my expectation. And then societal expectations, right? Because if everyone expects certain things to always be shared, then that's not really something I should expect be kept private. And that might be different in different cultures, different countries, different relationships, right? Hmm. An organization like yours, like the Future of Privacy Forum, how much of the work you do is advocating for one position or another versus facilitating conversations and bringing everyone to the table? A good chunk of our time we spend, I'd say, educating and helping. And, and by that, I mean core members, core supporters, core donors of ours are the chief privacy officers of you know a wide range of companies. And many of them are very smart and very sophisticated. But if I'm the chief privacy officer of a big bank, I probably don't work on facial recognition issues every day. But you know what? There might be some place where that's going to be used in my thing, maybe to secure my, uh, to, to let me log into an app, right? I might not be an expert on de-identification. I'm probably a real expert in all the banking laws. I'm not a machine learning scientist, right? I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I'm a policy person. So everyone needs to understand more deeply these adjacent technologies, because your company is using it, or others are using it, or your partners are using it, and you can't ask the smart questions. You know, if you're sitting down with a machine learning expert in your company, and they say, hey, we're going to do this, is there any problem? And you need to know, well, wait, is there personal information in a model? Or wait, what questions should I be asking about bias? And, you know, I, I need to know enough to be thoughtful about what I'm doing. And and not just companies, right? If I'm a regulator, what experience do I have? I don't have big teams of machine learning experts, but but I'm being asked to make decisions here. Or right now, regulators are being asked, hey, what are the rules around location data? Well, guess what? That's pretty complicated, right? So we are scrambling to pull together from both experts internally and the fact that we know a lot of the experts, right? Some We, we have location companies in our camp. They know what carrier data looks like. How precise is it? Is it? They know Wi-Fi data. They know Bluetooth. They know GPS. Uh, they know how do these things get integrated so that when my device says, here's what an app might know about location or here's how we're mapping you, what really goes into that? Because guess what? If you're an epidemiologist, you better understand how accurate or messy or phony or precise the data that is you know, being handed to you now, hey, this can help you do your job. This can help you uh, spread data. So we do a lot of cross-sector education. Now, does that help when it comes to policy? Yes, right? Because if somebody's saying, well, hey, I think there's problems around location, we got to have a regulation. So no one can collect location without express permission. And then we say, uh, yeah, but like, so every time you come to a website, uh, you got an IP address. And guess what? That reveals sometimes some kind of precision around location. But right. you can't really turn that off, right? Oh, and by the way, you probably don't want to because it's also used for fraud and for these purposes. You actually perhaps want to define what you mean by precise, and then you probably want to allow by default certain uses like this, 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 and this, and this. But we're typically not going to be sort of saying, and therefore, here's what you ought to do, right? We're more likely to say, let's explain how it works, right? Both, not just the technology, because you can hire or find technologists and experts it's hard to actually understand what's the full flow, right? What happens at the computer, at the phone, at the network, the business models, who's buying, who's selling, who's got what. So we certainly will have some, some opinions and we do work on uh, policy and legislation, but, but we're not the lobbyists. We're not the public policy people as much as trying to provide expertise to the people who are at the table coming to it by trying to actually understand well enough and being able to communicate and explain. So our site 
at FPF.org is full of sort of infographics about how it works. All right, Ben, what do you think? It was a really interesting interview. You know, I've sort of never thought of the privacy issue in the way that he described, where it's not necessarily about privacy per se, or it is, you know, in part, but it's more about some of the fundamental rights we hold dear, you know, our ability to participate in democratic society, our freedom of speech, our freedom of association. Privacy laws implicate all of those rights. And I've sort of never heard it articulated the way he articulated it. And that's kind of, you know, the main takeaway of of that interview for me. Are you in agreement with where he's going with that line of thinking? I am. You know, I think privacy is sort of a nebulous concept. There is obviously some worth to privacy for privacy's sake, but a lot of it is we want to protect our more fundamental rights, our rights to meaningfully participate, to get our ideas out there without government suppressing them or, you know, making them unavailable to the general public, as we've seen in authoritarian countries. It certainly can relate to, I don't want the government to see my embarrassing pictures on Facebook, but it's so much more than that. It's about... Hmm our freedom to communicate with one another in a way that we feel we can do so freely without being interrupted by an overbearing central government. I think that's a very good way of framing the privacy issue beyond what we sort of narrowly think of as, I don't want my emails to be read by somebody else, you know? Mm -hmm. And he talked Mm -hmm. about that too. Like the issues were narrower in the past. We talked about, oh, this website has cookies, you know? And then when you start to think more broadly that's when you realize the the far broader implications of um, why we need to protect privacy. Um, And Mm -hmm. I think, you know, to get people to care about these issues, you sort of have to talk about it in that uh, more broad sense, because I think it's, it's obviously people in our community care a lot about privacy for privacy's sake. But I think, you know, to all the individuals that we've talked to who say things like, well, I got nothing to hide. So who cares if my mm. communications are read by a government agency? I right, think explaining right. to them that we're dealing with larger forces here is important. And I'm glad that Jules uh, was able to do that in this interview. This episode is brought to you by Palo Alto Networks, the leader in cybersecurity. As AI-driven attacks increase, organizations can't afford to have network security that's stuck in the past. Discover how Palo Alto Networks can help you predict what's coming and proactively secure against it with a zero-trust, AI-powered network security platform built to secure whatever, whenever, wherever. To learn more, visit paloaltonetworks.com slash network security platform. The Caveat Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our thanks to the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security for their participation. You can learn more at mdchhs.com. Our coordinating producers are Kelsey Bond and Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening.